Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, looks like we've got uh, quite a list of people that have joined us. So thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to come to you today and talk just a little bit about what life after Safer at Home looks like here in Washington County. Uh, with me today, I have uh, Sheriff Marty Schulteis. Uh, also on the phone with us uh, today uh, is Kirsten Johnson, our public health officer from Washington Ozaki Public Health Department. And what we just want to talk a little bit about and give you a chance to ask some questions, uh, give you some answers as best we can uh, about how things are going to look and work here in Washington County. So there's really three primary uh, tenants to how I, as county executive, uh, see things opening up. Uh, and obviously last week, uh, as we announced our blueprint to reopen, uh, first and foremost, um, I believe uh, in Wisconsin, we have lost the consent of the governed uh, to at least to live under lockdowns uh, as we had for the past two months. Um, furthermore, the Supreme Court made it unequivocally clear uh, in their ruling uh, that uh, there was the un unenforceable rule of uh, Secretary Designee Andrea Palm, Order 28, Safer at Home. Uh, so they ruled, again, that that was invalid and unenforceable. So between those two things, um, there is no larger, broad-ranging, safer-at-home-like order uh, that is in place in Washington County, nor is there such an order that will be in place in Washington County. Um, that being said, uh, we strongly urge folks uh, to follow the guidelines of the CDC. Um, the blueprint that we put out uh, really weeks before, actually almost a month before um, all of this transpired with the Supreme Court, uh, as well as um, any industry specific guidelines that your business or your organization might be getting. So for example, the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, I know, put out a broad ranging uh, set of guidance, uh, as well as a number of associations such as the Tavern League and others. So we strongly encourage all individuals and businesses to look to those uh, guidelines uh, to open up and operate their business or organization and live their daily lives. And finally, and, and maybe uh, most importantly as we move forward, um, please know that uh, Washington County uh, as a county government um, will do everything it needs to do in the event of outbreaks. So we have our public health department, the Washington Ozaki Public Health Department has been doing a fantastic job over the course of the last two months uh, with contact tracing and, and managing of outbreaks. And there have been outbreaks in our county uh, as well as Ozaki County, our partner in public health. Uh, and when those outbreaks occur, uh, they will, the public health department will use every uh, tool at their disposal to help mitigate those outbreaks. Uh, first and foremost, working with businesses and organizations to mitigate, uh, and if, necessarily, if necessary, apply any legally binding orders, but on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis specific to that industry, organization, uh, or business. So, um, We'll, I, I'm sure over the course of the next several weeks, we're gonna have instances where things like that occur. Uh, and, and we feel, I feel strongly uh, that counties and government in general's first responsibility uh, is to secure the rights of citizens uh, in those unalienable rights that we read about in, in our constitution back in school. Um, and then after that, uh, to provide uh, exercise powers with the consent of the governed uh, for the safety and happiness of, of all people. And so we will do that in, the, in that order exactly. So uh, what we wanna do today really is, is give you a chance uh, for some Q&A. This is really about uh, what the people on this call are interested in um, getting some questions and answers for. And before I open it up for that, I will uh, turn it over to uh, Sheriff Schulteis for any comments he has, and then uh, the same for 
our public health officer, Kirsten Johnson. So we'll start with uh, Sheriff Schultz. Do you have anything? Yeah, thank you, Josh. So the, what I would say is that since the uh, overturning of Safer at Home, that the pendulum really has swung from the government responsibility to a more personal accountability for the, the well-being and the public health of, in general. And uh, what, I, what I can say is that at this time, it really it, it gives both the business owners and the citizens of Washington County and the state of Wisconsin, for that matter, really the opportunity to demonstrate that you don't need government regulation, you don't need government mandates, that you don't need regulations, that people can uh, be responsible for their own public uh, safety and sort of public health uh, while trying to follow these public guidelines to kind of give you a framework for doing that. So that is, that's very important to me that uh, that pendulum has kind of shifted over now. Uh, and what, but I, what I would say, and County Executive kind of alluded to it, is that uh, if there are uh, outbreaks that occur at uh, certain facilities, whether it be companies or residential or commercial properties, that the Sheriff's Office is committed to working with the health department um, if they determine there needs to be very localized public health orders put in place, that the Sheriff's Office is very committed to uh, assisting public health with those uh, with the enforcement of that. Okay, thank you, Sheriff. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Kirsten Johnson, our public health officer. Thank you and good afternoon. I just wanna comment on the current situation in Washington County. As of this morning, we had 152 cases. And if anyone has been following our case counts, um, you would know that since the beginning of April, we've been in a steady decline in mid-April until last week. And our numbers have been increasing um, daily. So. Our message is that the coronavirus is still here and we're asking everyone, um, all of our citizens to continue to exercise caution. And we recognize that all of our businesses are open, but we continue to ask for people to physically distance, think about how you can engineer distance between um, individuals in business settings um, and to continue, to continue to wear PPE as appropriate. Um, and then finally, to assess your own risk and assess the risk of individuals who may be patrons in your restaurants or in your businesses. Um, and finally, our message really is that we want to work closely with all of our business partners and our community partners to open safely, which is where the heart of the blueprint FAQ that's on, online um, stands that we're here for technical assistance and we really would like to slow and prevent the spread in our communities and need everyone's assistance to do so. Great, thank you so much, Kirsten. I appreciate all of your hard work and, and your input. And to that end, I, I just wanna make sure, I know we've got a lot of uh, business owners on this phone call. Uh, and as you, you've noticed in uh, our presentation, kind of those three tenants that I talked about earlier, um, the county and the public health department will certainly, in the case of an outbreak, use whatever resources we have uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, including those which are legally binding if necessary. But in that, in that regard, uh, as the sheriff alluded to, this is really a, a, a individual responsibility issue and a personal responsibility issue. Uh, we certainly don't want to get into a situation where it's gotta be um, some kind of citation or, or harsh striking order. Uh, but I'll, we will ask that you think about, uh, as we go through circumstances like that, you think about the, um, the risk uh, that you have just opening your business. Um, there's still, uh, obviously there's health risks involved, there's uh, legal risks involved, there still is no, no tort reform or no uh, legislation that has identified how uh, an outbreak is handled and who's liable for such things. So, there's a number of factors that you as business owners uh, need to think through and we're fully confident you can do that and we're fully confident and trust that uh, citizens can make decisions like that as well. Uh, once again, we urge everybody to follow the guidelines uh, that I laid out a little bit earlier from our blueprint uh, with Washington Ozaki Public Health Department all the way through CDC and, and maybe your organizational association. So with that, uh, we're, we're gonna open it up for some Q&A uh, and it looks like we've already got a number of questions that are coming in. So once again, thank you. Um, let's see. So uh, I should say before we get, get going here on the uh, Q&A, uh, you can see on your screen uh, how to ask a question. I'm sure many of you have been on Zoom calls, but for those who haven't, 
uh, feel free to type it into the uh, Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can type it in. Um, or if you're on the phone, you can dial star, star 9, um, and then you can use the star 6 uh, to mute and unmute as appropriate. Another option uh, is that uh, you could email ethan.hollenberger, uh, that's E-T-H-A-N dot H-O-L-L-E-N-B-E-R-G-E-R at C-O dot Washington dot W-I dot U-S. So sorry to go through that for all of you who have a screen. There are some people who are on the phone, so we want to give them that opportunity as well. So uh, with that, we'll start uh, with the first question. Other than the Washington Ozaki Public Health Blueprint, are there any detailed guidelines for youth sports to reopen in an organized and safe manner, specifically uh, baseball in our communities? Um, so you, as is alluded to in that question, the health department has uh, provide guidance in that regard. Kirsten, are you familiar with any uh, additional resources uh, uh, with with regard to youth sports in general? We've not seen anything, but the state said today on a call with all the health officers from all the various counties that there was going to be something by the end of the week. Um, and I would suggest maybe going to the Little, Little League website, um, but we've not seen anything specifically. Okay, thank you. Tesh, we are on Facebook Live, so they can comment in the... Oh, okay. Sounds like we're additionally on, uh, on Facebook Live where you could put comments with additional questions there as well. So for, if, you're on, if you're watching us through Facebook Live, feel free to use, utilize that resource uh, as well. And we had some submitted uh, with the uh, registrations. Um, so some, Sandy asked, what best and safe practice is being recommended for PPE and home use? And where can a person find reliable and reasonable masks? My parents are in their mid 80s and I live with them. I'm trying to be as safe as possible while opening myself to more things, uh, to more as things proceed. Kirsten, can you help with so, that? Yeah, I would recommend um, if possible, try to keep yourself sep as separate as, as possible at home. So quarantining yourself in a room, using separate plates and separate silverware, separate glassware. Um, you can certainly mask at home if you're um, interacting with your parents, and then frequent hand washing and wiping down surfaces that are high touch. So sinks that you may share, door handles that you may share. Um, again, the idea is to mitigate as much risk as possible in between you physically, um, and then to clean and do as much as you can um, so that there's no transfer of, of virus between people. Uh, this was a Facebook message from over the weekend. I'm looking for advice for upcoming wedding and reception that is being held in Washington County. My fiance and I are from Illinois and we are getting married on June 13th with a guest list of 280 people. Um, Ourselves, friends, and family would all be traveling and staying at a hotel. Uh, Illinois is currently under stay at home. Is our venue allowed to hold our wedding when social distancing would not be possible due to all of us being in a small space and the nature of this event? Looking for any info um, so I can tell guests if we're postponing or not. So allowed, uh, in the question allowed being the, the key word there, uh, they are certainly allowed to, to have the wedding. Um, however, uh, I know there's guidance that the public health department has in this regard. And so again, I'll, I'll turn it over to Kirsten for that guidance. Sure, so the venue is allowed. They may have their own policy. So I would suggest reaching out to the venue specifically. Um, Weddings are tough. So when you think about risk and you think about risk of large groups or mass gatherings, there's less risk when there's an, in, an in invitation involved because you know everyone who's there. So it's much easier for, for example, if there were to be an outbreak for the health department to actually do the contact tracing because you know exactly who was there and who interacted. But if you think about the risk around weddings, weddings in particular have a high risk because there's a high likelihood of people interacting closely with one another. So despite best intentions for social distancing at wedding, we all know that there's dancing and hugging and um, it's generally a very close, um, it's, an, it's an event where people interact very closely. It's family members, 
close friends. So there's a high likelihood of transfer of disease. So um, in mid-June, we don't know what the environment's gonna look like. It's certainly, it, you, there's nothing stopping a wedding from happening, but from the health department's perspective, we would not recommend a wedding in mid-June at this point. The risk is high of disease transmission. Very good. Uh, looks like we got another one on the Q&A. Uh, for Zoom, will there be testing for people who may have had the virus but don't know for sure? So I know we're working on uh, uh, testing similar to what you've seen in uh, Dane County and, and um, Waukesha County, for example. That looks like that'll be in the first part of June. Kirsten, can you speak to that? Sure, so we are working on a mass clinic in Washington County on June 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, and information will be available about that on, on Wednesday. Um, and that will be open to anyone who is, symptom, is symptomatic or asymptomatic that wants to know if they have uh, COVID-19. So if someone is interested in finding out if they had it previously, which is um, antibody testing, there currently is, are a number of antibody tests available. The question is whether or not they're accurate. Um, and they are not yet widely available on the market. My understanding is there are some healthcare providers that are using them. Um, so you could reach out to your primary care doctor and ask. Um, and I, to be honest, don't know who's using them at what level and what capacity, but they are, they are available, they are available on the market. Um, it's unclear how reliable they are, but you would have to reach out to your provider for more information. Very good. Thank you for the question. Uh, here, another one that just came in from the uh, Q&A. Hi, I'm a pastor in Richfield. Do you have any guidance for churches reopening in person, uh, in personal worship beyond what you have in the plan? I'm particularly interested in any answers for con congregational singing. Thanks. Um, so that's a great question. What we have is in our plan, but interestingly, that came up today on our on a call. Um, singing in particular, um, as you can imagine, when you project your voice, you're more likely to project top droplets into the environment. So if you are going to have singing, they suggest that there is significant distance between the people singing and between those people and the congregation. Um, it does sound like DHS is planning to have some more guidance come out around uh, religious services, hopefully by the end of the week or early next week that will have more detail, but I've not seen it yet. Yes, and, and one thing I'll point out from uh, one of my pastors asked a very similar question, and, and when I reviewed the guidance, and if I go straight here, Kirsten, please, please correct me, but uh, I think that's one of the reasons for the 25% capacity suggestion uh, for a church. It seems a little bit extreme when you first read it, uh, but the more you think about how much close interaction there is and things like singing, uh, it, it starts to make a little bit more sense. So uh, I know that a couple of churches in the area have decided that they're going to add the number of services they're doing to try and accommodate that 25% uh, margin. And I also know that there's, there's no direct science to the 25%. It may be a little more give or take, but you're really trying to create as much space as possible is really the goal. Okay, we've been, sorry, Kirsten, do you want to add something? No, no, that, um, no, that's absolutely correct. So we've gotten a couple, one on Facebook, one via email, and I know we had one earlier on sports. Uh, so, um, combining them kind of is one part of it is what needs to be done to ensure um, that baseball, softball, et cetera, can start their season. Um, and what, so what needs to be done to open them in a safe manner and would it be safe for the community to come out and support kids, families, significant others, both adult and youth. Um, and then anything on when a timetable is appropriate to open those. Uh, youth sports, adult sports, rec sports. So it's very hard for us to give a timetable only because we don't know what the next few weeks are going to be get, bring as things start to open. Um, in our FAQ, we have some loose guidance around youth sports. Um, there's some information around what's considered a high impact versus low impact sport, and we recommend only low impact sports. 
Um, I think the message for organizers of youth sports, even adult sports, um, is that there's inherent risk in bringing kids together. Kids are going to be very difficult to social distance, even despite our best intentions. That it's going to be hard to do. Um, you know, sports like baseball are going to be less difficult than others. But again, you know, you're still sharing the ball, even if all kids have their own equipment. Um, I think it's really going to be dependent on the organizers to um, assess their own level of risk. And remember that you may have participants who have underlying health conditions, or coaches who have underlying health conditions, or older, you know, grandparents who want to watch. Um, all of those, those people who are at high risk should be discouraged from participation. Um, and again, I, I think it's really dependent on the organization to make some of these decisions. You are, there's nothing saying you can't do it, but you need to recognize the inherent risk in, in, that, in those activities. Yeah, that's right. And the other thing that I would add is, and I said this a little bit earlier, and I know there's people coming in and out of the call, so I'll just say it again. Um, because of the Supreme Court's uh, decision, uh, basically stating that uh, the public health department uh, can't do any broad ranging rules. Uh, please know that this is this is guidance. We're trying to give you the best advice possible. Uh, and so you should take it as that, that it's guidance. And uh, that we're still in the middle of a, a serious pandemic. Now, I, I know there's lots of opinions about how serious and how much has it already been out there and all of those things. Uh, but it's undeniable that it's a, it's, it is serious and people have and are dying from it. So um, please take this as, as advice and encouragement. And also, as was said earlier, and again, people are jumping in and out of the, the call here. Um, there also is some need for you to look at, look to your insurance company and maybe even consult legal counsel, depending on the circumstance uh, as regard to, to your risk in those areas. Because although those are, that is separate uh, and different from the risk that the public health department is advising you on, uh, I think you, there also is risk in those areas too. So uh, it's, it's a, that's a complicated answer, I know that, but um, in this circumstance, government isn't here to tell you what you can and cannot do. Uh, we're just giving you all the information so you can make the best decision. So we got lots of questions coming in now. Um, Another one on the Q&A, uh, and this is very much in line. There's, there's two of them that I'm going to try to tie together. One is, do you have any advice for festivals that are scheduled to take place during the summer? Uh, and then another one that's similar, what is the timeline or requirements you are looking at to increase capacity to 25% or more? I still say those are together because uh, festivals have, have similar uh, guidance on that 25% kind of a rule. Um, the answer to the festivals is, uh, and we've been dealing with this on, on festivals that we're all involved with uh, as well, and, and again, Kirsten, you can correct me if I go astray here, um, but as of this moment, um, you know, unless there's some way for you to ensure that that social distancing can happen in 25% capacity of indoor or outdoor facilities, um, you should really think long and hard about whether or not you do it. And of course, you've seen uh, plenty of festivals, uh, indoor and outdoor across Southeast Wisconsin and the nation uh, that have canceled. Uh, and what is the timing on that specifically? Um, I, I don't, there is no good answer to that because as Kirsten pointed out a moment ago, uh, as the evidence comes in, as the data comes in, uh, we can adjust and make uh, different recommendations and will as we as we have. Um, but right now the data doesn't point to anything, any other guidance. So um, could we say we'll revisit it in two weeks? Yeah, sure. Um, and I say all of that knowing that uh, there are people making decisions about festivals in August or late July that need to start making decisions now uh, because they're getting all of their ducks in a row. So there's, again, there's no simple answer. Um, it, it is somewhat of a moving target as we get more data, um, but certainly that 25% capacity rule uh, is, is best practice guidance as of right now. Kirsten, anything you want to add to that? No, I think that's, that's 
a good summary. And as we learn more, we'll be able to give more targeted guidance. Okay, we have one on the phone, is that correct? Yep, Jerry. So, Jerry Amen, if you want to unmute, he raised his hand. All right, Jerry Amen, if you want to unmute, unmute yourself, you can go ahead. Okay, we have some on Facebook. Will be recommended for people to wear masks in public places such as restaurants, stores, etc. Yes, so in the FAQ, we do recommend that people wear masks and in stores and at restaurants, or obviously it's difficult to eat with the mask on. <laughs> um, so that's one of the reasons why we have a limit on restaurant capacity at 50% or recommend a limit on restaurant capacity. Let me, let me reframe that, rephrase that. Um, recommend a limit on restaurant capacity and also recommend uh, distancing between tables because we recognize that's a challenge when you're eating or in a or in a bar. But yes, we do recommend wearing masks. And Kirsten, is that is it safe to say that that's the case, particularly when physical distancing is is the most difficult? <clears throat> I think yes. Definitely. Um, and I can give an example in if you're working in an office and you have your own office, you don't need to wear your mask in your office. But if you're interacting with your coworkers and, you know, printing and handing papers back and forth, you might want to consider wearing a mask. So it's similarly, if you go into a grocery store, you can't gauge how crowded it's going to be. Um, and you might walk within, you know, a foot of someone you might you would should consider wearing a mask in those situations. Right. Thank you. Okay, uh, sorry, here's a question from the Q&A. Sorry if this has been covered, but I have a question about assisted living homes and when will, so I'll, I'll just say uh, long-term care facilities in general, uh, and when will the in-person visitations begin again? That's a great question. Um, currently CMS, which is the Center for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services, is has a, um, a rule in place that visitors are not allowed. So CMS is the authority that grants nursing homes their license. It's federal. Um, the reason it is so restrictive, and I know this is very, this is one of those things that's been really difficult for families and for individuals who live in these facilities, obviously. Um, the reason it's so restrictive is because long-term care facilities in particular house our most vulnerable, and those are the individuals who are at greatest risk of infection and subsequent um, consequences. So I know this is a really hard answer, but we don't know when that could potentially be lifted. Um, and, uh, but we also recognize that those are the most, that's our most, most vulnerable population. And those are the individuals who need to be, who need to be protected the most. Yes, I, and I'll just piggyback on that a little bit uh, and say that, you know, the, the the challenge uh, for government all along has been, uh, you know, that the consent of the governed, as I talked about before, and for the first four weeks, especially, um, I, I would say Wisconsinites and people in Washington County did a fantastic job of um, living through and with safer at home, um, really without much trouble or grumbling, from what I could tell. Um, and now that that has come to an end, uh, it really is more of a surgical approach, as I alluded to, this kind of case-by-case -case basis. And we know at the end of the day, we know that population, uh, anyone in a long-term care facility is in that vulnerable population. So now uh, the work of public health uh, and really health care in general uh, is to narrow and focus on how do we do our best to, to keep those folks safe. And so it's a balancing act. And I think Kirsten and our team over at the health department and healthcare industry in general, both long-term care facilities and hospitals have done a great job and will continue to do that. And unfortunately, uh, restrictions like that might be in place for quite a long time. 
Um, another Q&A from Zoom, will the Washington Ozaki Health Department guidelines be updated as the risks decrease and increase? Uh, the, uh, Kirsten, do you wanna address the decrease and increase risks? Sure, so we um, will adjust the guidance accordingly. Um, right now I can tell you that the, we, have, we actually have internally some gating criteria or gate, gates that we need to see either um, get better or worse before we change anything. Um, our suspicion is that things will get worse before they get better. Um, I am not sure what the appetite is of our communities to um, close things down, but I think how that what that will end up looking like is as Josh mentioned, as we have outbreaks, and I know this is a reactive versus proactive approach, but as we have outbreaks, we will close facilities or businesses um, so that they can clean and so we can stop those specific outbreaks. And if it comes to a point where we need to do more, we, are, we will we'll look, we'll look at that specifically. So that um, piggies back on um, somebody's question on Facebook, what is the plan? If Wash Oz counties have surged, will the county start to close businesses? What does that mean? And how do we know where an outbreak is? So, um, yeah, they, like Ethan said, just to piggyback on what Kirsten uh, was just saying, um, our approach will be, as she mentioned, uh, somewhat of a reactive approach uh, insofar as where outbreaks are. Now, um, Kirsten and her team for weeks now, maybe months, have been doing a great job of contact tracing, number one. Uh, at one point, about two or three weeks ago, uh, we had double the amount of staff dedicated to contact tracing as our neighbors in Milwaukee County, if you can believe that. Um, and so they've been doing a great job for a while. So contact tracing will be critical. Uh, and then also reporting those outbreaks. Um, her, again, Kirsten and her team have done a great job of putting that information out um, uh, on their website and, and um, keeping people up to date. So those things will continue. Um, but this is why I, I, I'll point back to that third tenant that I talked about before. The public health department, uh, with the assistance of law enforcement if necessary, will do what needs to be done to, to um, mitigate those outbreaks. Uh, and so, um, it, again, it's a case by case, very specific approach. Um, but if, if a business owner or an organization is, is not cooperating, um, there are still legally binding things that the health department and, the, and law enforcement can do. Uh, we hope it never comes to that. Uh, that's a last resort, but um, we will send a, a strong message that if, if organizations are not taking this seriously uh, at, after an outbreak, um, there, there are consequences. And it's not just on the, on the um, law enforcement side, it's also, like I said before, on the, the civil legal side uh, and on the insurance side. So um, we're, we're not messing around. Yes, it's, it's a reactive approach, um, but just like everything else in life, you need to know that if that happens, there's consequences. And um, and you know maybe the sheriff can speak to this more uh, as a law enforcement side, but there's consequences, and we'll use the tools we have to use if, as a last resort, if necessary. Even if it got to that point, we would still uh, want voluntary compliance. That's that's always the goal. But if, uh, if, you're, if we're having a business or some facility that's not cooperating with the health department, then law enforcement may have to step in and, and do uh, escalated enforcement. Like like the county executive said, we don't want it to get to that point at all. Um, and I can just say that from the health department's perspective, we've dealt with now many outbreaks, I think over 25, and overwhelmingly businesses and organizations and um, long-term care have been gracious and fantastic in working with us, and that's our expectation moving forward. But in this scenario where we need to use um, something else, we have that in our toolbox. A couple of Facebook questions, maybe more people who want to see a safer at home order in Washington County. How do you feel about the message to America's youth that the county they live in isn't following the guidelines issued by the President of the United States team, but having a 14-day consecutive drop in new cases? Um, so the first and the question is, are we reopening before we had 14 days of consecutive drops in new cases? 
And are we following the guidelines of the president and his team? So in, in Washington County specifically, uh, I can say that we, we had a blueprint to reopen weeks before either the president's plan uh, or uh, the governor's Badger Bones Back plan. We had our, our own plan with our own gating criteria in place. And before all of this, um, all of this happened with the Supreme Court, um, and, and, I, and Kirsten alluded to this a little bit earlier in the call, we had we were well past 14 days of consecutive decline in Washington County. So um, at that point, we were advocating for uh, local local control. Um, again, not quite as the Supreme Court ended up defining it, but that's okay. It's the Supreme Court's prerogative, um, and we wanted local control to be able to implement our blueprint, uh, which would have been a, a more phased approach. Um, under the ruling of the Supreme Court, we clearly can't do that, and so here we are. Uh, and, and now uh, we're doing, utilizing the tools that we have um, within the constitutional um, framework that uh, the Supreme Court laid out uh, to proceed. And so um, that's, how, that's how we'll continue to move forward and we'll continue to urge people to, to follow the guidelines uh, out of love for their neighbors. Um, so then, um, I guess there's a, there's a lot of questions too in some of that were submitted um, here about how to plan for future events and what the steps are and how to make a decision on whether or not you're gonna have a festival or not have a festival or if you're a wedding venue, how to have, should you have those or not have those? Um, what kind of things are they looking for to answer whether or not these larger events should happen? Yeah, so, I'll, I'll ask for some technical assistance from Kirsten on this answer, but what I will say to you is if you can tell us in four weeks what uh, all the data looks like in terms of positive tests and deaths and hospitalizations and ICU um, uh, beds filled, then I think we can give you an answer as to whether or not you should have your festival. Of course, we don't have that information. No one does. Um, we don't know what it's going to be like now that uh, for the for large extent, businesses are are opening and and industry is opening back up, um, and so we're trying to give you the best guidance we can with the information at hand. Um, that's not public health's fault. That's not uh, any individual person's fault. That's just the climate we're living in right now. So um, once again, you have the you have the liberty to do as you wish, um, and we're urging people to follow the guidance and, and weigh the risk uh, and then make that decision. There's, there is quite literally no legal, no law enforcement component to us telling you uh, follow this guidance. Um, it's a, there could be an outbreak. If there is an outbreak, it'll be addressed um, and, and we'll rely on people to do the right thing. So I, I'm sorry it can't be more black and white than that, but this is still a serious pandemic that we don't know where it's gonna go and, and we're all trying to make these decisions together. Kirsten, anything you wanna add? I do, so if you look into our um, Blueprint FAQ, there's um, under mass gatherings, I think, there is a table that sort of assesses risk based on the type of gathering you're considering. And if you look to the right-hand side of that table, there's a a link to the World Health Organization risk assessment tool for mass gatherings. And it's um, it's designed for international events, but it is helpful in thinking through how you could potentially mitigate exposure when you have an event. And I would recommend people take a look at that. Um, again, it's, it's linked in our Blueprint FAQ under um, gatherings, and it's through the World Health Organization. They have an Excel spreadsheet. You go through and answer questions, and it gives you a score, and then you plug that score in and sort of walk through your risk assessment. And I think it's really helpful when thinking about how, how, how and when a festival might potentially be safe. We talk a lot about outbreaks. Kirsten, can you just define what an outbreak and the threshold for an outbreak is? Um, so we know what we're yes. about. So an outbreak in a long-term care facility, which includes nursing home, assisted living, um, et cetera, memory care, rehab is one individual, so one resident or one staff person. So it's a pretty low threshold. And the reason the threshold is so low that it, it's because if you have one case, it's highly likely, highly likely you have more than one. Um, 
And then in a business, it's two individuals associated with the business um, that likely were infected this, through the same pathway. So they work together, they had lunch together, they're on the line together, they interact in some way, you know, their administration together. There's some interaction that would connect them um, to cause it to be an outbreak. Let me answer that one. Okay. Um, our school has a summer child care program. Can we open that if we follow the blueprint recommendations? Also, our church hosts a VBS, a Vacation Bible School in July. Is this something that can be held? Um, again, there, it's not a matter of if you can do it. It's a matter of you, you weighing the risk on whether or not you should do it. Um, so, uh, Kirsten, could you address the child care programs and vacation Bible school programs, the guidance for how, to, if and how to do those? Yep. So again, in our Blueprint FAQ, there's information about child care. And I also believe the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation came out with child care specific guidance. Um, I think that's on our page where the Blueprint FAQ is. There should be a link there. Um, if you are licensed through DHS or any other entity, they will also have guidance on how to open um, safely. So I would suggest you look at those resources as well. And then in terms of vacation Bible school, and this really applies to any sort of day camp, my understanding is DHS is going to is planning to come out with guidance um, at the end of the week for camps and day camps. Um, I, you're not the only one asking that question. We've gotten a lot of questions around camp and day camp. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have much more to give you other than we're waiting for the guidance too. Kirsten, are there, this was submitted to us from a, a venue, but are there any consultants or employees from the health department that we can work with directly to ensure we are following best practices? Absolutely, we're available. Um, there's, we have a website, an email, just email COVID-19 at washozwi.gov. So it's COVID-19, one word, no dash, just COVID-19 at W A S H O Z W I. So it's all one word, wash Oz W I dot gov, G O V. Um, and someone will respond. We have a whole team that's providing technical assistance to organizations and businesses that have specific questions. Um, so there is no safer at home order in place, but we have guidelines uh, and we're asking for voluntary compliance. Is, can somebody maybe define what reopening means? If we're not suggesting uh, mass openings are safe or that COVID's gone, um, but what are we saying in a world without safer at home? Are we saying open and go out as you normally would? Are we saying something different? Yeah, I think that that's a really great question and a great way to frame the larger issue. And the answer to that is government can't answer that question for you. Uh, you have to weigh the risk, whether it's an individual and should I go out and should I uh, grocery shop or should I go to the park or should I go to a ball game? Should I go to my neighbor's house and ha at a party? You have, you have to think about those risks, weigh them and make a decision uh, on your own. Uh, and the same thing is true with businesses. And of course, the risks you're weighing as an individual are different than the risks you're, you're going to weigh as a business or an organization. Uh, and you need to think through those things. We're trying to give you some risk assessment material uh, from with regard specifically to COVID-19. Uh, but again, there's other things you've got to balance. And once again, county government is not, government just in general, uh, is not here uh, to tell you this is the answer for you. You got to do that risk assessment on your own. And by the way, I know it's easier if we just tell you what you can and cannot do uh, in some ways, um, but it's quite, it's actually the antithesis of what I think we, uh, I'll speak for myself, what I think government exists for uh, in this country. Okay, um, here's another one from uh, Zoom. If you are the only person leaving the household for work, uh, grocery shopping, et cetera, Aside from hand washing, what other precautions should we be taking to protect our spouse and our children, et cetera? So ideally when you are out in the in in 
out in the community, you should be wearing a mask as well. So when you're doing your grocery shopping, et cetera, hand washing. Um, if possible, you should try to quarantine yourself into a bedroom on your own, eat, you know, eat from different plates. I realize this is impossible and I can speak from my own personal experience. I have three kids um, who want to cuddle every night and I do it and I'm the only one in my household going out and right. working every day. Um, so I think it's really, it's a level of personal comfort. I think I would have, it's a different answer if you have someone at home who's vulnerable or who has underlying health conditions. Um, you know, I think you just have to take those things into consideration and do what you can to bring the least amount of germs into your house when you come and go. Okay, another one, uh, another Q&A question from uh, Zoom. Uh, even though the Safer at Home order has been lifted, are we still following the Badger, Badger bounce back plan? And if so, what phase are we in? Um, the short answer to that question, I'll, I'll just answer this directly because I feel like the Badger bounce back plan was predominantly a political plan. Um, the, we, we really never were following the Badger bounce back plan. Uh, although I will say that we, immediately before the Supreme Court took action, uh, the Wisconsin, uh, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reported that we were green lighted on all the aspects of the Badger bounce back plan. So we would have been going into a different phase. Um, now, uh, there are no phases, uh, so it really has become irrelevant. So, um, no, we're not following the Badger Bounce Back Plan and, and phasing is irrelevant at this point. Uh, additional question, uh, I think I got the same one here on Facebook, very similar. What steps can businesses do if patrons refuse to follow the precautions uh, set in place? Um, I can, probably, yeah, I can probably take that. So it, it, it's, it, it kind of is a law enforcement issue on your own private property. So as a private property holder, um, you can kind of dictate what goes on on your private property. Um, so you're always looking for voluntary compliance just as, uh, as law enforcement does um, and trying to convince that person that that's, uh, that's the way in order to, to have access to the property, you would appreciate their, their compliance. But in the end, if they refuse to, uh, to cooperate with you, um, and I think this would be an extreme example, but uh, you can tell them to leave the premise. And if they're not, if they won't leave, they're trespassing, which then becomes a direct law enforcement issue. Um, I don't know if we get to that point, um, but uh, um, you certainly have that option as a, a business owner. So sure on that, uh, somebody on Facebook commented, guidelines without orders are toothless. It's like saying, don't drive drunk, but if you choose to, it's at your own risk. How is this a little different than that? Well, it's a, it's a little different because the, the uh, um, private property owners still have those rights where they can, it's very similar to some of the big box retail stores in, in Washington County that are mandating masks that they're wearing. Um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a business policy that they want to put in place. They're able to do that. Um, and if the customers don't want to, uh, to wear the masks, they don't have to shop there. Um, if they maintain they want to shop there but don't want to wear the masks, um, they end up uh, being asked to leave and eventually law enforcement could be called. Okay, uh, I had somebody um, Facebook message me a question as well. What, what are the impacts of all of this on schools opening in the fall? Um, well, I know that uh, we have been in consultation with superintendents from throughout the county over the, really the last, uh, just over two months, two and a half months since the beginning of all of this. Um, there, we were part of uh, the discussions for if and when schools were going to close before the governor closed all the schools. Uh, and I know that those superintendents are still having conversations about what next fall looks like, uh, quite frankly, as is um, the Department of Public Instruction at the state level. Um, I know Kirsten has been involved or at least uh, kept up to speed on what some of those conversations are. Uh, and I know there are se separate decisions being made in the different districts about things like summer school and summer activities too. So here's that anything specifically you want to add about what you're hearing with regard to schools in the fall? No, I think the intention is to have school in the fall, but again, because everything's sort of in flux and we don't, it's unclear what the summer's going to look like. Um, I know DPI is working closely with all of our superintendents and all of our districts um, to make sure we do it safely, uh, but there, has not, there have not been any decisions yet about what that's going to look like. Okay. 
Um, another another question that I, had been brought up earlier when this the question about um, uh, child care came up, uh, one of the Facebook messages I got was, "Isn't that a contradiction to what how um, youth sports are being handled?" Um, I think everybody acknowledges, especially under Safer at Home, uh, and even in uh, our blueprint to reopen and, and some of our guidance, um, it's these things are littered with contradictions, not because um, we're trying to be contradictory, uh, but because there's different circumstances that surround each one of these things. So one of the frustrations, for example, that I had was uh, under Safer at Home was uh, Walmart and Menards can be open selling furniture, uh, but the furniture store down the street here in West Bend cannot be opened. It literally made no sense. Um, with regard to youth sports and childcare, uh, I would say the only difference there, uh, yes, there's some level of contradiction, but um, we, need, we need to have childcare in order for us to go back to any sense of normalcy. Uh, and people going to work and all of those things. And quite frankly, there was childcare even in the middle of Safer at Home. Um, so that I don't think that's quite the same as a optional youth sports activity. Um, but it goes back to one of the comments that was posted as well. And, and that is even though we're, we're no longer living under Safer at Home, uh, the purpose of why that existed in the first place still exists. And that is a very serious pandemic, uh, which we should take seriously. Well, at least a very uh, serious virus, which we should take seriously. Um, so a question that was emailed um, when you, you drove by a bar, or restaurant on Friday it was packed with people. How would the the health department be able to do contact tracing if there was an outbreak after this type of close contact? In other words, how could you possibly call everyone when you have no idea who was in the bar that night? Uh, and our business is supposed to be keeping a log of patrons in case of outbreak. So that's a great question, and that's one of our greatest fears. Is in a scenario where there's a packed bar, it's almost impossible to do contact tracing. Um, what I, I can just tell you, give you an example of how that will play out. So a week from now, when we get some positive cases, one of the questions we ask them is, where have you been? And have you been in any crowded environments? And have you attended any gatherings? And it will likely come out from multiple people that they were in the same restaurant or bar. Um, and that's how we that's how we backtrack. But the idea that we will be able to identify every single person who was in that space is um, it's not feasible. It would be almost impossible. Which is why we're trying to put limits on the numbers of numbers of percentage of people. Not trying to put limits, but rather guidance around um, capacity, because it would be very difficult for us to identify everyone who is potentially exposed. And and as Many of us know that there are people who are asymptomatic and are still carrying the virus. So it'd be very hard to identify everyone and slow it down in a scenario like that. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that was, I think everybody's concerned with um, the, the fact that there are no um, enforceable rules in place. That being said, um, there's uh, another question is along the exact same lines and what, it, what are the consequences if such a situation were to happen in a bar or restaurant? And the answer is the consequences are gonna be on that, really on that business owner. Uh, and, and that's not just a, a law enforcement type of a consequence. And I've said this over and over again, but there's, there's legal liability. Congress has not addressed what the liability, uh, uh, the, the tort reform I talked about earlier, what the legal, uh, liability is for a business. Um, insurance companies need to be consulted. I know on, while Safer at Home was going on, insurance companies were literally telling businesses, if you've opened, you're breaking the law and therefore you're breaking your policy. So I, I don't know what those answers are today, uh, but that's why it, it, the consequences could be severe. I, I do not know, um, but both formal and informal, they could be severe for that business. How do you handle that with all the patrons who happen to go there? Um, well, just probably just like any other event that happens at a, a circumstance like that, you put up, you will end up putting out some kind of message that there was an outbreak at business XYZ. Uh, and if you were there on this date, uh, in this part of the day, um, you should self disclose or report to the health department. And, um, and that, that's the best that they can do. 
uh, once again, I, I don't think government can solve this problem. And quite frankly, I don't think it could have solved it with Safer at Home. Uh, another question on the Q&A um, from Zoom. On your Washington Ozaki County page, you have documents posted under other resources from the Badger Bounce Back Plan. If you're not using it, why are these posted? Example is entertainment guidelines. Uh, do we use these guidelines or not? They are more detailed than the FAQ. Uh, I, I think the answer to that question is relatively simple. Um, just because we didn't buy into the whole Badger Bounce Back Plan doesn't mean we we throw the whole thing out. You don't, we don't use the old saying, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, there's still some good content in there. The, the um, Department of Health Services and uh, Division of Public Health at the state have done some, uh, some good work. Um, I think there's plenty there. We point you to a lot of resources. Uh, Kirsten earlier mentioned the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Uh, we have our own blueprint. Uh, we're trying to be uh, as much of a resource as, as possible. And again, you're the, you as individuals, you as businesses need to weigh the risk. Uh, if a business is discovered to have a COVID-19 patron, will that business be closed for 14 days? No. <laughs> it's, it's, if we can trace an outbreak back to a business and their operation, essentially. On that, Kirsten, though, um, there is an emailed question. What would happen if there's a mass outbreak throughout the county state? Will Safer at Home or portions of it be enacted again? Uh, I, I, the, an, the answer from, I think, the county macro is no, Safer at Home is gone and won't and can't come back. Um, I guess unless we just violate what the Supreme Court has ruled. Uh, and I know full well that there are counties to our south and to our southwest that are have uh, orders in place. I also know that the Wisconsin Counties Association has basically said that those also are invalid and unenforceable. So um, I, there, I don't think will be any such plan unless and until the governor and the legislature make a different decision together. Uh, and so far, it doesn't appear that that is or will happen. But that's not, that truly isn't a county government issue. That's, that's really a state government issue. Okay, any, do you have any other I don't have any questions? Nope. I don't either. Okay, well, we went about an hour. It's what we, about what we expected. It, uh, we'll just give you another minute or two uh, to submit a, uh, any final questions. Um, but uh, we want to thank you for taking the opportunity to, to clarify a few important things. Uh, thank you to our Sheriff, uh, Sheriff Schulteis, uh, for being with us, our Public Health Officer, Kirsten Johnson, and uh, if both of you would share with your departments our sincere gratitude for the work that they've been doing in the midst of this crisis. Um, got some thanks from uh, some, of, some of the folks out there to pass along as well. Um, your help and guidance is much appreciated. So uh, once again, thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. Please um, stay healthy and stay safe and uh, do it out of, out of love for your neighbors. So thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you.